What's going on you guys? Welcome back to the channel. In today's video we are going to uh, remake the classic um, board game, memory game, guessing game called Mastermind. We are going to do it completely from scratch in Python uh, and we are going to use the Kivi graphical user interface uh, framework. So the total program takes about 330 lines of code. Um, it shouldn't take more than maybe an hour and a half, two hours of solid programming, but we're going to do it line by line together. As always, the full program will be available uh, in the GitHub, which will be linked in the description of this video below. Uh, so if you do have any questions, um, even any questions once you get the code and are messing around with it, be sure to drop them in the comments below. If you are enjoying this tutorial, want to see more like it, be sure to leave a like on the video, subscribe to the channel. That helps me a ton. And a quick note about uh, Mastermind before we dive into the coding tutorial. Um, if you played the Word game that was somewhat viral in the past year, Wordle, this is sort of like it, but this game is much, much older. Basically, you take uh, four colored pins and you guess what combination the uh, code master, which in this case is just handled by the app, um, has set a secret combination. And then you get hints back that tell you about your guesses. So basically, if I guess red, orange, yellow, and green, then these two pins are telling me, red is telling me that I have one that is the correct color and in the correct spot white is telling me I have one that's the correct color but in the wrong spot. So I might say, okay, let's assume red was in the right spot and the right color, so I'll keep that one. But that orange was the right color in the wrong spot. And then let's say uh, the other two were wrong, so I'll guess two blues. And I actually get the same set of clues. So I could either proceed as if that was still an okay guess and keep trying, or I could assume that I messed something up. And here you can see I get no clues. So actually there's nothing right. So this is a very fun game. Uh, I played it as a kid growing up, and I include a quick like menu that tells you the, the key um, for the game as well, as well as being able to restart at any time, and then a button for submitting your guess. And other than that, it's just 10 chances to make a, a right guess, and then the answer will be revealed up here when you get it correct. So all in all, visually, there's not a ton going on, but using the Kivi framework, which isn't something we've done a ton of on this channel, it is a great challenge and it's a lot of fun. I had a lot of fun building it. I hope you have a lot of fun programming along. And last thing before we dive into the tutorials, I've got to say a quick uh, couple of thank yous because um, I have been moving again. I'm in a new location. I'm not completely set up in my new house, um, but I'm changing jobs. I have a new baby. So it's been a wild time for me personally, and I've continued receiving a lot of nice comments on videos on the channel. Um, I My Patreon supporters, Dale and Philip, I appreciate you guys so much sticking uh, with me through this uh, tumultuous time and we're going to be getting back into some regularly scheduled programming some big projects coming up we're almost at 8,000 subscribers on the channel which is just awesome so thank you so much to everybody who's stuck with me through this I hope in the next weeks and months that we get a much more permanent uh, office setup I do own a house now so I'll be taking a room and turning it into a more permanent office have a better works uh, workshop in my garage so we'll be doing bigger Arduino builds and stuff like that. So be sure that you're subscribed to stay up to speed with all the new stuff coming down the pipe on the channel. And without any further ado, let's dive right into this line by line pro programming mastermind tutorial together using the Python programming language and the Kivi graphical user interface framework. All right, let's dive right into this coding tutorial line by line. I am looking forward to doing it with you guys. I will give myself a quick line of defense and say I haven't done a project this size in a couple months, so if I seem a little rusty getting back into it, just bear with me. But the two modules that we are gonna use in this build are random and of course Kivi. So I like to just kind of import those up front. Um, you don't have to, you could just uh, kind of go build the project and when you notice you need a module, you import it then. Um, but the reason I put these right at the front is you might need to do pip install Kivi to make sure it's in your package. Uh, there's plenty of videos on how to use pip if you're unfamiliar. But basically, um, there's gonna be a section in here where we say from kivi.app import a ton of things. So there's gonna be import the base class of our app and user interface features from Kivi classes. And I'm gonna store all of those up here for right now for setting up the basic app. Let's just do from kivi.app 
import and then the app like that okay there's going to be a lot more lines right here but what i want to do first thing is just get a window going and one thing I'm actually going to do um, is I'm going to set the window size to be uh, the dimensions of a phone. So Kivi is naturally natively resizable, which you'll see when we boot this up. But one thing you can do if you say, look, I'm formatting this to mainly be playable from like a mobile device, like that's how I developed it. So you want to see it in that default size when it boots up. Well, use window capital W dot size equals. And then the most common mobile format right now is nine by 16, which if you multiply by 100 and divide by two, this is a nine by 16 aspect ratio. So this is like nine by 16, which is mobile for the most part and phones are adaptable to nine by 16. So this will look pretty good, but we haven't imported window yet. What we're going to do is from kivi.core.window import window. Okay. And you can see it actually put it right where I wanted it to put it um, right below the import app. And so this is just going to boot up our default window in mobile size, which I like, I think that's a good idea. Um, so let's go ahead and continue building this program. Um, and so what I'm going to do is I'm going to make a class for my mastermind app and I'm going to call it mastermind app. And then in here, I'm going to put app, which is going to be that Kivi app that we imported. And I'm just going to put pass. Um, you have to do this. There's some Kivi specific syntax going on in this function, but this is defining our base class of, of the Kivi app. Um, you could change your app name here. So uh, you can call this whatever you want. Mastermind app. App is just what I'm calling mine. Um, but basically this is important. Whatever comes before app because you need to make a .kv file with the same name. Um, so mine is going to be called mastermind.kv because I called my app mastermind app. Um, so if you said whatever board game app battleship app, you would make a file battleship.kv for mine. It's mastermind app. So I'm doing mastermind.kv. And the only thing I'm doing in here is I'm doing this main widget with a colon and then main widget in angle brackets. I'm not going to dive too much into why right now, but, uh, this is because you could use the dot KV language, almost like when designing a website, you can use CSS to define style elements in your HTML page in your web page. In Kivi, you could use the .kv design language to, def to, de to define style and functionality in your main function, but you're also able to define it, most of it directly. So what that means is we're going to make a main widget class in here that will define most of that stuff. So class main widget, and it's just gonna be a widget, okay? And I'm gonna use kind of a free floating canvas, um, which is sort of the, uh, Kivi define whatever you want everything's floating um, and so we need from kivi.uix.widget to import the widget um, you could do uh, most of the Kivi tutorials you'll see online also use things called layouts like grid layouts or um, box layouts anchor layouts you could do that some of the big projects we'll do in the future almost certainly will use that um, but I am going to just make it a uh, like a canvas so a free floater um, and you can combine all these things together to be clear it's just um it's just for getting it set up just follow along okay there's a lot going on with kivi all right so then the last thing we also want to do and then we'll go back to defining our main widget class so for now i'll just put pass but we need to come back up there um we need to initialize the app and command the run method to execute then start the app okay that is what doing this is so if underscore underscore name underscore underscore is equal to and then quotes underscore underscore main underscore underscore and then quote and then colon then all we want to do is whatever we named our app so for me that's master mind app dot uh and actually you need the parentheses here and then dot run to call it as a method okay this is because Kivi, which is this really nice framework that was built to be cross compatible and built to uh, be able to run on mobile apps, has a few things that you need to know about its life cycle. I'll include this image 
uh, which I found online. I'll include this image with the GitHub, but it basically shows you that when you run your Python file, it will call Python start, Python run, it'll build itself, and then the on start function kicks up. Um, so this is basically telling you the things you can use that are built into Kivi on pause, on stop, uh, resume, all these things that will kind of control how things uh, run internally, externally with iOS or your operating system. I found this useful just for an understanding kind of point of view, but uh, you might not if all you want to do is build a working mastermind game. So we won't dive into it too much here. Just understand calling mastermind app dot run in this if name equals main is kind of setting us up for this app to run. All right. Now, I believe if you boot this up, nothing's going to happen because we haven't done anything for main widget yet. So you can see the window is actually uh, the appropriate size, which is a win because we made it 450 by 800. Um, but there's nothing whatsoever on the screen, no functionality, nothing going on. Um, so let's go ahead and start filling in this main widget widget. OK, that's a really great just building the basic Kivi app that we just did there. Although you might think I talk too long, take a little too long, <laughs> but that's okay. So now let's go into class main widget and let's start defining some stuff. Um, the first thing we're going to do is we're actually going to define the init method, which is just going to sort of steal all of the built in um, stuff that Kivi widgets have so that we can use it. And so to do that, it's def underscore underscore init underscore underscore. And then for arguments, it's just going to take self because it's inside a class. And then star star quarks or keyword arguments, it's basically saying it could have a variable number of arguments. We don't know yet, but we want to set up to take anything. And then call super main widget self, just like that. And then dot underscore underscore init uh, underscore underscore and then pass in quarks. OK, these two lines might look like a bunch of magic and gobbledygook. And honestly, to some extent, they are. Uh, especially if you're a beginner intermediate programmer. But basically we are saying, hey, Kivi went through a lot of trouble, the designers of Kivi, to make main widgets, have a bunch of built-in functionality. Even though we're about to define a bunch of custom functions for our main widget, we still want access to all the built-in stuff that the Kivi creators gave. So uh, that's just kind of a quick crash course in why those two lines and just to start copy them down as is as you get more and more into Kivi and programming I'm sure you'll start to understand why we need that a little bit better but now let's go ahead and do um, something real quick let's create our first function that I'll just call self dot and remember when you're defining functions inside of a class you start pretty much everything with self that goes for variables and uh, functions methods if you will and let's call this one init bg okay so we're going to initialize the background when the app boots up we're going to draw everything onto it that needs to be there at the start and then we'll kind of refresh the background uh, draw new things onto the canvas change colors and shapes and locations based on touch events or we'll resize everything when the screen resizes. So we're gonna have a whole bunch of functions in here. We're going to have initialize the background, um, redraw the background, change it on size, uh, update the background when events happen, on touch down, change things, uh, initialize the buttons, draw the buttons, check the guesses, draw the menu. Basically, all of the code for our entire game is going to be sub functions of this main widget class. But one foot in front, of the, in front of the other, one step at a time, let's just take a look at how to initialize the background, okay? And so, uh, again, to take you back, I think I have a mastermind image here. Oh, no, that's the menu. Um, to take you kind of back to the game that we were playing, I have a, a picture here of the final app. It's this grid, right? We want to create this grid um, with the six selectable colors at the bottom, buttons even below that, and then a grid with sort of the four circles on the left uh, in, a, in a die pattern, like the four dice, uh, the four pips on a die, uh, and then these four just laterally. And so um, up here, there's actually going to be four showing the answer with a cover over it, and then a menu button. So that is the style we want it to look like in the end. Um, but of course, our app currently has none of that and actually it just failed because we haven't created in it background yet um, but so we want that kind of grid just reminding you what it needs to look like so let's go ahead and define 
initialize the background with self, just like that, Oop. just like that. Um, and now we have to start defining all those things we want on the screen. So to do that, we say with self dot canvas, just like this, Oop. colon. And now we're going to create basically rectangles, um, all the different shapes and selected and buttons and lines and things that the grid needs to have. So we're going to go through and keeping kind of that image I just showed you in mind, we're going to build all the things that need to be there on the start. And we're not gonna worry too much about functionality just yet, but what you'll see is like, okay, first thing we need to build is like the rectangle that's going to cover um, the answers. So that would be a rectangle. So self.rect equals capital R rectangle. And let's give it a BG color equal to capital C. Don't worry about the red squiggly lines yet either. We're going to import everything. But capital C color, and then it takes an RGB value that is scaled from 0 to 1. So if you're more familiar with RGBs from 0 to 255, this is just them as a fraction of 0 to 1. And these three numbers are literally just a number I pulled out of my butt as guess and check. So I thought that it was a fun, uh, good looking color. But you can see there's a couple uh, red squiggly lines here because we need to import from kivi.graphics.rectangle we need to import the rectangle and then same deal for this capital C color uh, kivi.graphics.color okay so there you go and you can see if you have the automatic import um, with using a nice IDE like PyCharm then it will just stick these on the same lines for you if you don't have an auto import, then you just need from kivi.graphics import rectangle and color. Um, I'll try to scroll back up here every time I use like the auto import tool so you can make sure you have all the right stuff imported. Okay, but this is actually still not enough uh, fully to have the rectangle um, drawn because what we need to do is we need to come up even before the define in it inside this class and we need to just say rect equals none like that. So we're creating a variable um, that's a holder and this is a capital N none. This is just a bucket, a holder saying, hey, I know there's gonna be something called rect inside of this function. I'm not even gonna define it as a rectangle yet. I'm just saying rect equals none, okay? So it's gonna be the rectangle at the top that covers the answer key. Uh, next, th thinking through the app, we're gonna have uh, a little circle that pops up behind the colors um, that you can guess. That'll be the actively selected um, circle. That'll be self dot selected and that's going to be an ellipse it's really i think of it as a circle um, but uh, a circle is just an ellipse where the width and the height are the same and since we're making everything resizable there is no guarantee that it'll always be a circle so it makes sense that it's an ellipse anyways Again, this is another fun color that I made up completely. So if you don't like the way my app looks, feel free to change these RGB values. Um, again, we need to import ellipse from kivi.graphics.ellipse. And a quick note, there are gonna be multiple options for import on a lot of these, especially if you're using um, PyCharm again, which shows tries to be nice and show you all the default things you can import. So just make sure you're importing from Kivi, Kivi.graphics. Uh, if it seems like something goes wrong when you hit import, go back and check, make sure you imported the right things. And then just like we did with rect, we need selected equals none up here. Um, Okay, and then one more rectangle. Uh, I like to show which turn is actually active. So there's 10 guesses, and it's important that we show the user what they're actively guessing. So I'm gonna copy the line from self.rect, and I'm gonna say that self.active is also a rectangle. And what you'll see is we're not defining these in location yet because that's gonna be something we do on size. We don't need to tell them where to go. And this, I think I just used like a light gray for the active rectangle. Um, but so those are the three shapes that I want to appear different from the background color. So we define those right up front. Now let's define a color we actually want the canvas to be. So the background, if you will. Um, and this is important because this will be all of the colors that have not yet been guessed. So like the... Um, 
yeah, pretty much everything else we draw will kind of have this as a default unless we override it and define it. So let's just go ahead and define a canvas color. Um, I will put a note for myself here, call the buttons to be drawn here. And uh, we're not gonna do buttons just yet. We're trying to draw the background. Um, but so let's do a couple other things because we can use some for loops here. Uh, there are 13 horizontal lines. Um, if So there's the, the top row and then there's 10 guesses and then there's the selections where you choose what color you want to be and then the buttons on the bottom. So what we'll do is we'll say for I in range 13, let's go ahead and say self dot horizontal lines dot append uh, a line so that'll be something new to import and let's make the line width equal to three pixels okay um, so what we need to do here is a couple things we need to import line from Kivi so import this name Kivi dot graphics dot line and then we also need to make a uh, self dot horizontal lines but it since it's up here it's not self it's just horizontal lines and we'll make an empty uh, uh, empty list for that but then we're also going to need to in the next step just thinking ahead here we're going to need to define the points for those lines every line can be fully defined using two points um, and then we're going to have some vertical spacers too, some vertical lines and so we'll make an empty list for them just to get ready and again those lines are going to need points so we're making some empty lists here for our vertical lines our vertical points our horizontal lines and our horizontal points okay so let's come back into the init bg function. Um, and another nice thing is when we kind of complete these functions or we at least move on from them, we can collapse them down and the program will get really easy to see. Um, so let's go ahead and do self dot horizontal lines append line width uh, three and we're not giving them positions just yet. We're just saying, hey, I want to sort of create this line uh, instance and I'm going to use it in the next step when I'm ready to draw it. Now let's go ahead and make just three vertical lines. We separate the vertical screen into uh, much smaller or much wider pieces, yeah. Um, so then self.vert lines append, uh, this will be a line. And again, I'll use line width three. That's another style thing you can play around with if you want to. All right, a couple other things we need to um, do. We need to create the four answers, which are gonna be ellipses. So thinking back to uh, the initial game that I showed you, even though we cover it until you guess correctly, the actual answer uh, pips, the actual answer selection of colors is going to be on the screen the whole time. Um, so that means that basically four I in range four because remember the interesting thing about four loops too if you're a total beginner is this will start from zero and it'll go up to the number you type in here but not include it so just circling back to some very basic python there but this will run for i equals zero i equals one i equals two i equals three but not for i equals four so we want four circles this will give us four circles um and then what we'll do is we'll make a new uh, list in a moment that we'll call answers. And so self.answers.append. And what we'll do here is we'll do an ellipse. Ellipse. But this one's going to be a little tricky because we want to change the background color here. Um, but we're actually going to want to uh, kind of randomly generate and answer colors. So what we'll do is we'll say, okay, BG color equals capital C color. And we're going to need a new list that I'll just, for now, I'll assume the list exists. And it's going to be called answer colors. And it's going to have three items in it. So it's going to have zero, one, and two. And this seems a little tedious, but all we're really doing is the same thing we've done a couple times, which is define an RGB. And I will move this whole line down so that we can see it on one line during the tutorial. So we are going to use um, a kind of random generator to randomly create uh, the answers. And it's gonna be four circles with different randomly selected colors. So uh, we want to select the R, the G, and the B value of each color in here. So um, obviously it's 
it doesn't see self.answers yet or self.answer colors. And we're not into the functionality yet. We're just creating the shapes. So let's just come up here and let's say, okay, answers is an empty list. And actually answer uh, colors will be something that will create a different function to generate. So I think for starting, let's just go ahead and do uh, this. Let's say answer underscore colors equals and I'm going to make it an empty list but what this will be this will be a series of four colors selected randomly from available choices okay so this is going to be something we flesh in pretty soon but for now I really care about creating the framework that we can play the game in so let's keep going with defining things if any of this seems confusing as we initially define it maybe you're sort of new to Kivi um, be sure to hold on to those questions because a lot of the confusing parts that we're defining right now might become super clear when we get to the functionality or even the resizing, things like that. So let's motor ahead. Let's go ahead and take a look at how to make all of the guess rows that are going to be empty and gray initially and then all of the uh, like feedback, which are those little squares of four dots that show up on the left side of the screen. So let's do that. Okay, so very similar to what we just did for the answers, um, we're going to do all of the guesses, but the difference is answers and even the selectable colors, the choices, are just kind of a linear list. Um, the guesses have to be our first look at an array, right? So it's basically a list of lists. And um, in total, the version of Minesweeper, or not Minesweeper, wow, um, the version of mastermind that I'm used to playing has 10 guesses. So what I'm doing is I am creating a list with 10 empty lists inside of it uh, because I am used to, yeah, like I said, 10 guesses. So you might have to do a little counting, which is hard when they all look the same for five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten. 10. But I'm making an empty guesses list. And then I'm also going to make an empty feedback list because that is where we put uh, information about your guess. And then I will make an empty list while I'm here for the choices. Okay, so red, yellow, green, blue, purple. I think orange. I skipped orange. Um, but we are going to have these empty lists because as we go through, we're filling them in with stuff. Um, we're filling them in with the colors from the actual information. So... Uh, we are going to need to make a couple, a nested for loop set, which is basically going to say for every guess, for every turn that we're going to have, which is going to be 10, for i in range 10, we need to then say, well, for j in range 4, or whatever variables you want. i and j are the two I learned the most common um, for loop variables for, so I always use those. Um, well, we're going to have to add self.guesses at i. So remember, i is whatever turn we're on. j is whatever column within that turn we're at. So self.guesses i dot append. And then we're going to add an ellipse. And its bg color is going to be equal to capital C color. And I'm going to just use a new variable that we're about to create called color. And I'm going to say color 0, color 1, color 2. You could use a quick uh, list comprehension to unpack the color variable. But basically, color needs to be something that uh, we store an RGB value in for every circle. So that's going to come from a list of um, not feedback colors, but the guess colors. So we're going to create, just like we did for the answer colors, we're going to create a guess colors list. But this one, we have to look at I and J because every single circle could be a different color. All right. So it's giving us a red squiggly line because we have not made guess colors yet. So let's go ahead up to answer colors and let's put guess colors equals another empty list, even though this one is going to be uh, a list of lists. So I'll do it that way just to remind us this is going to be list of lists um, all 10 rows of guess colors here all right and since i'm here let's just go ahead and use this for feedback colors as well because the feedback colors and the guess colors um, 
are going to be, you know, similar in terms of four feedbacks per turn and uh, in 10 total rows. So they'll be similar once we get to actually defining the colors, which we'll do as soon as we define the shapes. And then choice colors, this one will be an empty list as well, but this will just be a list of red, orange, yellow, green, blue, purple. All right, we're gonna define those colors, but first I just want to get everything done in this init BG function. This is honestly probably the most complicated or tricky uh, function that we're doing other than maybe establishing um, a, a on touch, which is gonna be the touchdown, which is basically how you play the entire game. So drawing the entire board in the background is really important and you're gonna be surprised how close to done we are once we get this done and done correctly. All right, so I'm gonna copy that for I in range 10, uh, for J in range four for the uh, feedback, but instead of color equals guess colors, it's gonna be feedback colors at I, J. And then instead of self.guesses.i, it will be self.feedback at I dot append. And we don't have to use J here. We will use J when we define their positions, um, but all we're doing is adding to the list, so J, is gonna go zero, one, two, three. It'll automatically become the zero, one, two, three index in that list. So we don't have to worry about that too much. Now what we'll do is last list we really have to define here is going to be for I in range six self dot and remember we made that choices list and this is just fun because it's just a list that shows all of the possible color choices so we don't have to do anything crazy with it um, but the bg color for these will still be equal to capital c color and then from here we need to use choice colors at i zero and then one and two and three. And I think what I've been doing is putting ellipse down on new row just so you can see it all in one item. So that'll be choice colors zero, choice colors one, choice colors two. I know my camera is down there somewhere, so let's scroll up a little. There we go. Okay, so now we've created, this is remember the initialize, not really the draw, but the initialize function that's going to define all of the shapes we need to use. We haven't done the buttons, but we will do those soon. Um, and then the last thing is the answer cover. So it's another rectangle that's basically going to uh, cover up the others. So let's say, let's make this thing answer cover equals none. And really this is a, maybe a little early uh, to define the answer cover because we might want to make it invisible just to make sure that we're generating um, an answer correctly. But basically self.answer cover is going to be equal to another rectangle. And the reason we define it down at the bottom is we want it drawn last. We want it drawn on top of everything else. And so this will be uh, another color that I made up, 0 0.65, 0 0.35, 0 0.45, okay? And this is going to be what gets drawn over top of the answer until the answer is correct, and then we'll make it invisible, all right? And so I think that's awesome. Um, I think that's almost everything. Again, like I said, we left a comment for ourselves to come back and call the buttons to be drawn. We've defined the horizontal lines, the vertical lines, we've defined the circles that'll go in the answers, we've defined the circles that go in the feedback, uh, we've defined the circles that will allow us to define the colors, um, but we have to make them all resizable. And so to do that, what I'm gonna do is I'm going to use, I'm gonna minimize with self.canvas. So this init.bg uh, self or init.bg self function, I'll actually minimize that whole thing. Um, what I wanna do is I wanna come down and I wanna define the on size function. Okay, and this is a little different from uh, the init BG function. We decided that this is what we were gonna call it and we called self.init BG right when the thing initializes. On size is a built-in Kivi function that we can access because again, we called uh, the super for main widget and every widget in Kivi has the on size built in function. This means that when anything happens that defines or resizes our app, that this function will get called and we'll just pass in star args because that is how I learned to do it. <laughs> um, 
But so there's something interesting here that we could do. Uh, we could do all of the code right in here, um, but I don't know why, maybe it's just the way I learned it, but I like to move it out into something called update background because we're going to update all of those shapes um, that we just initialized to have a size definition based on the size of the screen. And you absolutely could define it here. This might be an extra layer of unnecessary extrapolation, but say there were a dozen things we wanted to do here, like something functionality wise, like print the new size into the console window and then update the background. I've just learned it's better to do self.update background as its own function. Um, so which means we'll come up here and we'll say define update BG with self. Uh, and this is going to be another long one, but basically all it's going to do is take all of those shapes that we just defined and it's going to actually give them where to go on the screen. Um, so this is going to be really important. Um, and uh, it's going to seem long, but because of all the initialization that we already did, um, it's going to go pretty quick. The first thing we'll do is the overall rectangle. We just called it rectangle. Um, if you remember, it's the first shape we defined and it's gonna be our background rectangle. So what I'm gonna do is say self.rect size equals self.size. Okay, I've just made the rectangle the size of the window and then self.rect.pause. And those are pretty much the two things every app in Kivi and really all graphical user interfaces need a size definition and then a position definition. How big do you want me to be? Where should I be? Those are really the only two things a shape needs in addition to color um, to tell you how to draw it on the screen, how to display it, okay? And so uh, that's it for the rectangle. Then what I'll do is I'll kind of cut the screen up into squares. So I'll make a variable called square size because we're gonna use this a lot. Um, and basically I want it to be an integer value because when you draw things, um, it's typically best to use a whole integer for your pixel or location width. Um, and I'll say I want the squares to be a sixth of the screen, okay? Um, and then I want the squares to be uh, 13th of the screen. So you remember we, um, we have a total of six squares that um, we want to draw things in, and then a total of 13 rows, I believe. So um, this square size variable is just something that's gonna be a lot easier than every time. And actually, okay, yeah, I'm getting a little squiggle because I said self.square size, but I forgot to initialize square size. So just like everything else, just make sure to add square size equals none up top. And now let's come back down into update BG. And what we'll do is we'll say, okay, we have 13 rows and two vertical sections for the overall background. So what we'll do is we'll say for I in range 13, remember those are our horizontal lines. We'll say the line height, and we don't have to do self.line height because we can define this variable right here. It's equal to whatever i is times self dot height over 13. So actually we can just say times self dot square size one. Okay, so again, um, this is about the same size as just typing in into self dot height 13, but might as well explain where we're getting this value from. So what I'm gonna say is, all right, my horizontal lines, make them i times the, the height, the y dimension of our square size, and then self dot hors points, so horizontal points, um, at i dot points, um, or I'm sorry, horizontal lines at i dot points is equal to zero comma, line height, so my line height, comma, self.width, self.width, comma, line height. All right, I gotta type that and then explain what we're doing. So actually, I think I misspoke when we defined the uh, points lines. I don't think we even need them. 
um, the whores points and vert points. I think I was thinking of this step uh, with horizontal lines and vertical lines. The only thing we need to do to fully define a line is give it width and color, which by default, the color I think is white or whatever we make the canvas, which we did in the init BG. And then we give it two points and it goes X1, Y1, X2, Y2. Those are these four coordinates. So what I'm saying is, at whatever we just defined the line height, the Y vertical point is going to be your Y1 and Y2. And then I want to draw from zero, which is the left edge of the screen, to self.width, which is the right edge of the screen. So this will give me 13 equally spaced lines going up the screen. Okay, so those are my horizontal points. Now, the vertical lines are actually going to be kind of differently spaced out. So the easiest thing to do will just be define them directly. So self.vert lines zero, the first one we made, dot points, dot points, there we go, is going to be equal to, and for this one, um, it's remember it's a line with width three. Um, so rather than put it on the left edge, because basically the three vertical lines I want are a left border, a right border, and then a line to separate sort of the feedback section from the guess section. So I'll say, instead of just on the left edge, I'll give it an X of two pixels. So since it's width three, that'll just move it a little bit to give it a left border impression. And then again, from zero, the bottom of the screen, uh, and then X two will be two, two again. So it'll be a vertical line on the left edge of my window. Um, and I will give it self dot height. So it will go the whole vertical stretch of the screen. That's going to be very similar to what, uh, whoops, to what uh, the second line, uh, self dot vert lines two will do. So let's go ahead and do that. Um, for this one, instead of uh, two, it will be self dot width minus two, and then um, self dot width minus two. And now the uh, only tricky thing about lines one, this is the one that we want to separate out um, from feedback and the selector. So what I'll do is I'll say, okay, I want four fifths. I want 80% of my window to the right of that. Um, and then I want 20% of my window to the left of that. So what I'll say there is, okay, I'm going to make it an integer because <laughs> you want integers when you define lines. And I will use self.width divided by five. All right, so 20% of the way to the right. Now, the tricky part about this line is we don't actually want it to span the entire uh, vertical screen. We want it to go until the selection row. If you think back, and I'll boot it up, I have the image of it here. Um, if you think back to our actual game, okay, and remember, this is not the stage our app is at yet. This is the final product we're targeting. The selection window does not need feedback, but we do have six colors, so we want it to span the whole width of the window. So basically, we want this vertical line to go, what would you say, 11 twelfths of the way down. Um, and then our two buttons are half and half, so this vertical line doesn't need to go the whole way. So we'll still use um, this 20%, this int self width over five for X1 and X2. Um, and we'll still finish at self dot height because that's the top of the window. But this starting Y point is just a little bit trickier. It's just gonna be, um, okay, int of self dot height divided by 13 and then times two. So it's gonna be two spaces up, right? We don't want it at the bottom, that would be zero. We don't want it up one row, that would be times one. We want it up two rows, so that's times two there. And that fully defines our three vertical points, okay? Um, and uh, again, that was an image of the final app we're going for. I can remind you what we have right now, but you've probably done this. If you try to boot this up now on your own, it'll give you an error, because we have not fully defined all those lists and everything. Uh, I just know when we do a lot of this style and design stuff up front, it can be hard to keep the finished product in mind. So I hope you're bearing with me. Uh, again, I might be a little rusty, so I hope the presentation style is okay as well. All right, so now let's go ahead and say um, the four color answer that should be hidden until the correct answer is solved. So four color answer gets defined here. We'll say for I in range, range four. What we want to do is say self.answers, 
at I. So we already made this list. And the two things I said, uh, you need to fully define a shape. Position equals, and then the next line will be size equals, okay? And the position is going to be equal to, uh, let's say self dot width over five. So I don't know, maybe I regret using square size. Nope, I'm gonna commit to it. I'm fine with it, okay. Um, the position is going to be basically a fifth of the window because remember the button on the left, which will be the menu, will take up one fifth and then the position will be uh, at a fifth and then times. So we have to use that uh, times I because this is a for loop. So it's going to go through all four of them. And then I'm going to say I plus one because uh, so the first one that'll run in this for loop is zero uh, and we want the first circle to start being defined at 20% not zero uh, so the one way you could do this is say from one to five instead of for i in range four so that way the first number that gets run is one or you just do a plus one here and actually it looks a little better since these are circles to just bump it a little more to the right so this is a plus one point one just kind of a fudge factor but this is me saying the x position of essentially those ellipses is going to start at 20 percent plus a little fudge factor okay that's what that point one is um and we might come back to this and uh mess around with it a little bit more i'm just <laughs> looking ahead i don't want to give stuff away or anything um but i have a random plus seven in my notes, so I guess this means that I thought it looked better scooted a little bit further to the right. So you can either see what it looks like just with that point one point one, or you can throw that uh, plus seven in to follow exactly. Um, and then we're gonna do something very similar with the uh, height, but we kind of need to, Kivi works sort of opposite from Pi Game. So if you've done some of the big Pi Game projects on, on my channel, or you haven't, that's fine. Pi Game calls zero the top of the window and the numbers get bigger as you go down the window. Uh, Kivi calls zero the bottom of the window and numbers get higher as you go up. It's neither is correct, neither is wrong. It's just two different ways of thinking about the window. So you just need to be aware of that when you define Y coordinates. But obviously like the first turn, excuse me, the first turn the way that mastermind works should be the lowest on the screen and you get closer to the answer as you do more turns. Um, so anyways, that'll matter more when we get to the inputs and the guesses than the answers. The answers are all gonna be in the top of the screen. Um, but we want them to be at basically the top of the screen minus a 13th. So minus, um, what would what was that that we used? Uh, square size one, right? That's, that's basically us saying a 13th of the window. Um, so this is just moving them down by one. And then again, I don't know when this happened or why, but I have a plus seven on that one as well. So I guess the thing to do would be use it because it's in my notes. So I must have said, hey, this looks better style-wise right there. All right, so that is fully defining the position of each circle. We are just using I to say where they should be. And we'll come back and we'll actually pretty much use those positions when we define the guesses as well. So it's nice kind of two birds with one stone there. And let's go ahead and say the size will be self dot square size. Finally, we're using it. Um, <laughs> square size zero. So that's saying uh, a sixth of the screen. And I'm just gonna trim it down a little bit. I'm gonna take 10 pixels off of it because um, it would it would look pretty squished. The edges of our circles would be touching. It wouldn't look very professional um, if we do that. So we'll use square size uh, one minus 10 as well for the y dimension and uh, square size zero minus 10 for the x dimension, okay? And this is fully defining our four color answer. So let's go ahead and steal some of that as our backbone for the, um, for the four color guesses by 10 rows, okay? So uh, this will not be for I in range four, this will be for I in range 10 and for J in range four, because now we have quite a lot more and we want to go through systematically and use them all. 
Um, so what we need to do is instead of this I times 1.1, that needs to become a J times 1.1, um, which is cool, but we also need to add something to use I in our Y definition. So J is all we have to do to get the whatever column it's in to get it drawn in the right column. But our Y coordinate, it's not good enough to just say um, uh, height minus uh, square minus a thirteenth of the window. Um, we actually have to say it should be progressively higher based on whatever turn we have. So what we'll do is we'll say, all right, um, square size one, uh, and I do still have a plus seven in there, but what we'll say is, okay, square size one times, and then this I have I times two, I plus two. Um, so this is similar to how we didn't want that vertical line drawn all the way on the screen. If you think about the first row of guesses, it's actually the third row on the screen. So when this is a zero, we want it to draw up two rows. That's why the plus two. And then it'll go through and do that 10 times and it'll make it one thirteenth of the screen higher every time. And then a little plus seven fudge factor. You could definitely move this seven into a variable as well if you really wanted to. Um, I don't, so I'm going to leave it, and we're going to move on. Uh, and that is pretty cool, the way we did that, um, but basically we can't exactly reuse this for the feedback now. Um, so this is going to be four feedbacks per 10 turns, or not per turn. <laughs> okay, four feedbacks each for 10 turns, okay? So uh, the nice thing about the answers and the guesses is they're a horizontal row. Now for the four feedbacks each for I in range uh, 10 and then for J in range four. The nice thing so far is everything's been horizontal. So we don't have to mess with elevation changes within one row. Uh, this I was just what we needed to correct for elevation changes per turn. Um, now, because we have this nifty little square, we do have to mess with that, which will mean that the row that we're showing is going to be uh, J uh, floor division two, which I'll explain in just one second. And the column will be J modulo two, okay? This is... If you've been doing a lot of Python programming or any programming, this is a nifty little trick to uh, alternate rows and columns based on something that's every other. So you can kind of get a grid um, just using one counter variable. Uh, so we'll still use I to move ourselves 13ths of the way up the screen, but we'll use J to change both the row and the column. So these are two less common operators, so I'll touch on them briefly. This is floor division, meaning it will always round down to the nearest whole number. So for J here, it's going to run 0, 1, 2, 3 in this for loop. Well, 0 and 1 divided by 2 are round down to 0 because the nearest whole number in that division is 0. Uh, this even works with larger numbers. Like if you had J floor division 9, 0 through 8 are going to give you a 0 because when you divide it, you have a remainder, um, but then you round down uh, to the nearest whole number. So J floor division 2 means that when J is 0 and J is 1, the row will be 0. And then when J is 2 and 3, the row will be 1. Now modulo... 2 means the remainder you have when you do division. So 0 divided by 2 has no remainder. 1 divided by 2 has 1 as a remainder. 2 divided by 2, no remainder. 3 divided by 2 has a 1 as a remainder again. So this, any counter, any index, modulo 2, is a really good way to say I want every other. And then floor division 2 is a great way to say I want 2 per. So floor division two will always give you two right next to each other. Modulo will always go every other. It's a useful way to do a grid. I've talked, <laughs> I've talked enough about ways to separate out rows and columns using one counter. So I hope you all feel enlightened. I'm going to move on. I feel like I touched on that for long enough. Okay, anyways, self.feedback at IJ, which are our overall counters saying whatever 
guess and then whatever column dot position okay so nothing has changed in terms of these still just being circles that need their uh, their position and their size fully defined so we're still gonna have these two things the position will seem a little crazy I think it's gonna take like three rows to fully define so let's actually just say size first um, basically self dot square size zero which was the original x size i want to take a third of that because i really need some gaps for this to not look goofy and then self dot square size one divide by three as well so these are going to be approximately a third the size of the full guesses which again if you remember from the the tutorial that's about the right size for them they're not they're not the thing you play with they're the thing that gives you feedback about your guess so it's okay that these are smaller now let's take a look at the position. Remember we need a uh, an X position and a Y position for both of them and we have to use it in terms of the row and the column we just defined. So the X position for this will be self.width divided by Oh yeah, I'm remembering now. Um, this was a lot of guess and check just to get them in a spot that actually felt good. So they need to be in that first 20% of the window, but because we're doing a grid of four, there's definitely some guess and check that you'll see in my numbers here, and you should feel free um, to play around with it if you want. But basically, an 11th of the screen, it also gets harder because you don't just want to type like a 20 in here or a 30 or a 40 because we want it to be dynamically resizable. So if you change the window, these numbers will still work and look good. Um, and you'll see that once we boot it up. But that's why some of these numbers are wild, okay? <laughs> so what we're going to do is we're going to say an 11th of the screen times 0.25 is how much to make the initial one so remember we have two columns for these it's gonna go 0 1 0 1 um, so initially we're gonna put it 0.25 a quarter of an 11th so a 44th of the width of the screen is the padding that we're gonna put and then we'll move it 1 11th over to the right, uh, which if you think about square size being divided up into sixth and then divide into thirds, we're basically saying, okay, the width of one of these things scoot it over one more time. And that's going to be the starting X position. Um, again, don't get too mad at me for basically this is, uh, this is some guess and check here. Um, but then the Y position will be a little tricky as well, but very similar to what we just did for the width. Self dot height of 13. So remember, this is the easier part to understand because this is saying we're going to move all of them times I, uh, I plus 2. So basically, the entire grid of four circles is going to shift 1 13th of the window uh, every I, so every um, P, every I dimension, and I should over indent that so you know that it's it's in the same row and give you a little back backslash. Okay, and then um, there we go, and now this is going. Whoa, I lost stuff. Okay, <laughs> that's all right. <laughs> I'm losing my mind. All right, integer of a thirteenth plus or times i plus two i can write the code but i can't teach it apparently here we go now the factor will be plus whatever row we are currently in times integer self dot height divided by 13 and then another little fudge factor of just times 0 0.4 okay so basically what we're saying is per row we know we have uh we know we have a 13th of the vertical spacing to play with for these two rows every time um and so what we'll do is we'll shift it by 0.4 of a 13th each time but uh then um we're gonna put in one more fudge factor and again this it gets a little complicated using all this int of self dot height divided by 13 again you could use I guess every place I did this you could use square size one 
Um, I'm just not being consistent because my brain is fried. But that's okay. Uh, times 0 0.15. So this is another, um, whoa. This is another fudge factor to just kind of scoot all of it up a little bit so it's not touching the bottom banner. Um, and then that should do it. Let me see why, uh, why this throwing a red. Is this indentation wrong? Let's see, do I have an unclosed parentheses here? I do. So I don't think we need to, I don't think we need this one. There we go. Alrighty, so let me talk about this really quickly uh, in case I lost some of you. This first row is where we want the X to be. Basically, when the column is zero, we just want it to be a 44th of the screen width off to the right. And this is hard because it has to be dynamically resizable to the window overall. But then when the uh, column is one, so every other, it moves an 11th of the screen farther to the right. Uh, then the Y is a little bit trickier because it's we've got a 13th in total space to play with and we use the row to change between those two, but then we use a little fudge factor to just get the bottom one off the bottom a little bit. Okay, so I'm not gonna talk about that too much more. You can play around with these sizings and spacings and fudge factors if you want yours to look a little different. Hopefully you, you like the way it looks. Um, but anyways, that is the feedbacks. So let's go to the next thing we have to define, which is going to be the uh, options. So the guess options, six ellipses showing six colors, okay? And so these will be easier for I in range six, 60 for I in range six. We're going to have, um, well, we are going to have to define the selected circle as well. So uh, part of playing the game is picking a color that you want to fill those spaces in with. Um, and then we need to show that that's uh, drawn by kind of highlighting it. So to do that, I draw another circle behind it. So what we'll do is we'll say if self dot selected color is equal to I. OK, so uh, this is a new variable, I think, right? that we need to come back up into our bang. There we go. Um, selected color. And this will start by just saying zero. So the way you'll play this game is we'll keep track of the index of the color you currently have selected. That'll be the selected color. And then if you click on a guess, it'll change that piece to that color. Okay, so what we'll do when we define where the selected, uh, where the options are, will also define the selected color circle. All right. And so, self dot selected, which is an ellipse we already defined. Dot pause. Dot pause. There we go. Will be equal to an integer value of self dot width divided by seven times times i plus 0 0.5 uh, plus a fudge factor of 2. So basically, we are going to use these same things, this self dot width divided by 7 um, and fudge factors to define the selected colors, but uh, we're also using it to define, sorry, to define the choice colors, the options, but we're also gonna use it to define the selected circle, just it's gonna be a slightly bigger circle, okay? So maybe I'm doing this backwards. Maybe we should have done the options and then the selected circle, but uh, we're, we're here now, all right? And then this one is uh, positionally, it's just going to be based on whatever the height currently is, okay? So, yeah, that's easy. Um, selected height divided by 13 um, because the selections row is not going to change. So the Y position for our selected circle will not change. Self.selected.size is going to be equal to self.square size at zero and then just minus four. So it's gonna be a little bit smaller than the maximum square size we've defined uh, by a little fudge factor of four. But 
um, it's still going to be bigger than the choices. Okay, so this is just me embedding a check to see if that color is actively selected within our for loop. And I'm actually just going to sort of steal the those two rows and you'll see how um, linked the choices and the selected is so self dot choices I self dot choices I instead of the position and size of our selected circle we're now looking at the six choices and the only thing we have to change are the fudge factors so basically we want to scoot these um, a little bit further in so plus seven and plus seven instead of plus two and plus two because they're going to be smaller circles so minus 15 and minus 15 instead of minus uh, four and minus four but still i times uh, i plus 0 0.5 to sort of scoot them where we want them uh, to the right and that is going to be it for the guess colors. Now we want to draw the active rectangle behind whatever turn it actively is. Active rectangle to be drawn behind active turn. To be drawn behind the active turn. There we go. And what we'll do is we'll say self.active.size is equal to the width of the screen, comma, self dot height divided by 13 or square size one, whatever you want to use. And self dot active dot pause will be equal to uh, zero. So it'll start all the way over on the left. And then the Y coordinate will be turn plus two because we need it to scoot up by two. Remember the first turn you could have is actually the third row. Um, so turn plus two and then times, uh, yeah, I guess we'll just keep doing self dot height divided by 13. Uh, and I have a little fudge factor of two in there just to scoot it up again so that it looks good with the borders. And this turn variable is not one that we want to define inside of our class. Uh, this is the one that makes the most sense to define up here with like our variables on the outside. But so you're gonna start on turn zero because in programming you just start counting from zero. You don't start from one most of the time. Uh, and that should do it for the active rectangle. So basically it's just a whole rectangle, the width of our screen that moves up as we take turns. Um, and now the answer cover is something that uh, will be determined by a variable called solved. It's basically a true or false variable telling us whether the uh, puzzle has been solved or not. Um, we haven't put the logic in to check if it's been solved or not, but for now we'll just say false. Uh, we'll say, hey, we haven't solved the puzzle yet. This is going to be useful for defining the answer cover rectangle because when we've solved the puzzle, we don't want the cover on there anymore. We want it to reveal that, hey, you got it right. All right, so we'll say if the game is not solved, then the answer cover, so self.answerCover.position is going to be equal to, and then the uh, int, comma, uh, int of self dot width over five. Um, it's starting position is going to be basically the opposite of the, <laughs> the left column, right? That first line that we drew to separate the feedback from the guesses, well, the answers are going to use that right 80% of the window. And then we'll just scoot it plus two to make sure that, uh, again, it looks good inside the border. And then the height of this thing, uh, int of self dot height divided by 13, um, and then times 12, and then really there's a plus nine fudge factor in here just to get it to look good. I encourage you, if you're skeptical of any of my fudge factors, you play around with these and you see how things look weird and different if you change some of these random values. Uh, I am just teaching it the way that I got it to where it looked good. So then the size is going to be equal to, and this one's pretty easy, it's int, I've got some extra parentheses in there, int of self dot width divided by five and then times four. So it's basically the right 80% and then minus six so that it looks good inside of the border we defined for it. And then uh, for height, really just self dot height over 13 looked good. So that's if it's not 
solved. Um, now, the easiest way to make a shape, in my opinion, um, the easiest way to make a shape practically invisible uh, in the world of Kivi is if you want it like, oh, we solved it. Rather than trying to scrub it from the canvas, I like just making it super tiny. So one pixel by one pixel, once we've solved the puzzle, technically the cover will still be there. We've just defined it to be basically invisible. All right, um, and now we'll add button logic here. So the buttons are gonna be pretty easy. We're gonna have one for submitting a guess, one for pulling up the menu, and one for restarting the game. Uh, that's why I'm not doing it in this initial setup. And I know you're like, well, Pete, we're doing everything else. Why not that? Honestly, it made sense to me uh, when I was planning this video. And if it doesn't make sense to you, sorry. But we're going to come back and do the buttons. I want to get everything drawing. Um, and that means that uh, we're pretty much there. We've just made almost the entire app dynamically resizable we've defined all the shapes we need to define some of those colors and then we'll finally be re ready to boot this up and actually see what we get because if you try to boot this up now just as a reminder it's going to give you an error because we have list indexes out of range because we defined uh, lists that we haven't populated with colors yet so the next thing we're going to do is fill those lists with colors so that we can then actually boot this up and see what we've drawn Okay, so we're just gonna quickly kind of use, or I guess let's say create a library of colors that are gonna be easy uh, to define here so that we can use them later and it'll be really clear what they are. So in terms of that kind of like one, uh, zero to one RGB scale, red is obviously all the R and no G or B. Orange is 1.5 and then zero. Uh, again, these are also style things where if you wanted six totally different colors for your game, you could just redefine them here. Um, but I'm going to use pretty basic colors, R, G, and B. Uh, sorry, R, G, and B. I'm using more than red, green, and blue in my game. I also have yellow and orange and purple. Uh, okay, so blue, <laughs> I don't know. Sometimes these things go a little long and I get a little loopy at this point, but you're still watching, which means you are my friend, so you don't mind me going a little loopy. All right, blue, purple. Uh, if you want my same color uh, library, just make sure to copy these RGB values down. Um, I'm going to use a gray that will basically be a medium gray, not too light, not too dark, 0 0.5, 0 0.5, 0 0.5. Black is all zeros. Zero, zero, zero. White is all ones. Okay, so uh, this is just me defining all of my colors so that when I make this like answer colors or choice colors or all these other lists, I can use their names instead. One really nice thing about Pygame is if you were to type like uh, red in, in quotes, it knows what that is. I don't believe Kivi handles them the same way. Maybe I'm wrong. Uh, correct me if I'm wrong in the comments, but red, orange, yellow, green, blue, and purple are going to be the options. And I can type them just like that because now those are variables that represent RGB values, okay? So those are the choice colors. Now the answer colors are going to be random dot choice from all of the choice colors. And so what's cool about this is uh, we can basically, and we will copy this code down into um, the like refresh. When you click the restart button or you solve the game and you play again, we'll copy this code, but you do need initially, you need answer colors to be after choice colors or it won't work. But what we're telling it is, hey, just pick from that list of choice colors, pick four times so we do that four times and that's longer with this large text I use to teach in um, that's longer than one row so I'll copy it down to the second row but the answer is just going to be equal to um, four randomly picked colors so they could be four all the same most versions of mastermind that I've seen you can use four of the same I think some people do house rules hey you can't do copies but um, that really limits you a little bit. So uh, we'll say, okay, 
um, four random choices. Now the guesses are going to be all gray with the exception that the turn you're actively on, I want it to be white. So basically just another way of showing what turn you're actively doing. Um, turn zero to start will be white. And then uh, the rest of the turns will be gray. You could do a kind of sophisticated for loop here. Honestly, you probably should, but uh, I want to be super clear on what's going on. So this will be white and then nine grays. So one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, and nine. Okay, and then a close bracket to end the list. And I accidentally did one too many close brackets. Looks really bad back there, so let's indent it correctly. Okay, so this is me saying I want the row that I'm actively guessing to be all white and then the rest of them to be gray. And then I'm actually gonna copy this list for the feedbacks. Um, and the difference there is I don't need an active uh, row white for the feedbacks. They can be gray until we fill them in with answers. So remember, these are kind of initial colors because once we get to the gameplay, um, we'll start changing these colors as we play the game. All right, so feedback's gonna be 10 gray lists. Guess colors will be uh, nine grays and then one row of whites. The choices will be um, red, orange, yellow, green, blue, and purple, and the answers will be four random colors. To see what the answers are, I'll actually turn solved to true so that hopefully uh, when we boot this up now, da, 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 drum roll please. Okay, we're still getting a list index out of range. So let's take a look at what the error that we made here is. And it's just a silly mistake, but when we copied the self.answers position and size uh, into the guesses section in update BG, we did not, or I did not, change it to self.guesses at I, self.guesses at I position size. And actually, because this is a nested, uh, this is a nested for loop, we need self.guesses IJ, IJ to get row and column correct in there. So just an easy, uh, kind of mistake to make when you're doing copy paste, but hopefully, let's see, hopefully that's the only error we get. Okay, cool. We boot this thing up. Uh, there's no interactivity yet, so you can't change the colors, but remember we have red as the currently selected color, and we got, um, I think, we got squares that look pretty good for feedback. Uh, we got a randomly generated guess. So if I close this now and I change what the actively selected color is to, uh, I'll make it four, which should highlight blue, and then we'll boot it up again. And what you'll see is we should no longer have red, or, uh, red orange, yellow, red, green. We'll get a new randomly generated answer. Okay, so now it's yellow, red, blue, green, um, and all of a sudden blue is the selected color. So uh, selected color equals zero. I'll send that back. Um, and now let's see, what else can we do? We can take a look at the resizing. And what you'll see is when I resize this, everything resizes with me because we defined everything dynamically in terms of our window size. So this is one of the really cool things about Kivi. Obviously it's cross uh, platform cross compatible, which means that it could be played on a whole bunch of different devices. So since you don't always know um, what the size of your device is going to be, sure you can define an initial window size, but you also define things in terms of resizability, rescalability, um, and that looks great. Two more things to test, and then we'll dive into the functionality. I'll set false, um, and then I'm going to move turn up to two. So the turn will look like it's actively two. And I'll say solved equals false. So now the answer has a cover on it. And actually, I don't like the position of that cover, so I think we'll tweak it a little bit more. But you can see the like gray highlight telling you what turn it is has moved up two rows. The whites haven't changed because that's something that changes uh, as we play the game, but it looks like our initial stuff is working pretty good. We'll go ahead and tweak the position of that answer cover real quick. Um, and so I'm gonna set turn back to zero and I'll leave uh, solved as a false, okay? So let's just real quick, let's go and update um, the answer cover. I'm not sure why that looked so much uh, worse there than it did when I when I made this. Okay, so if not solved, then self.width over five plus two, 
uh, a thirteenth of the screen times twelve plus nine. That's, gosh, uh, oh maybe it's because this plus nine was was in here before. Is that could that be it? Someone tell me. Let's try that. Uh, oh, but now what am I doing? Oh, I don't. You don't actually need this in a tuple. Okay, now I'm totally going off script. Let's just see if that was what we needed to do. It still looks pretty bad, doesn't it? You guys can be honest with me. It's in, it's in the right spot. Okay. Um, I don't know. Maybe if we make that a seven, does it look better? A little better. I don't know. Guys, this is crazy. All right. Uh, we're going to make that a plus seven. We're going to move on and get into the functionality. You guys don't need to sit here and watch me uh, fudge numbers for a little while. So... Let's go ahead and start thinking about how the game is going to get played, and that means we are going to use basically the only other, in my opinion, the only other really confusing um, function in this game is the on touchdown. So this is another Kivi built-in function. I recently did a tutorial just dedicated to this on the channel, but basically, um, I'm going to say uh, right below on size here, I'm going to define on touchdown and it's actually here you go on touchdown self and then it includes touch as an argument it's another of kivy's built-ins kind of like uh on size so what we're going to do for this is we're going to get the x position and the y position of the touch but in terms of uh percentage of the screen so basically what i want is touch which is that argument kivy gives us dot position zero um, and I want to define it in terms of the width of the screen. So I'm going to divide it by the width of the screen times 100. And this will give me a percentage that I can now check uh, that will be 0 to 100%. Okay, and then Y pause, I will say touch pause 1, and then self dot height, and then times 100. Um, and the, to show you what this is doing, I'm going to print a few things, okay? I'm going to print X pause comma Y pause, and then I'll also print down below touch uh, dot pause, okay? So the, this is going to give you X and Y in terms of a percentage and then in terms of a pixel. And what you'll see is because we defined everything to be dynamically resizable, we don't want to use pixel definitions as much here. We want to use percentages of the screen. So I'm going to run this. I'm going to try to make the terminal window down here uh, a little bigger, all right? And now I'm going to click, all right? So let's say I'm clicking pretty much in the lower left corner. What you'll see is my percentages say that was 4.6% and 2% of the window. And if I click up here, it was 11% uh, X and then 95% Y. But these pixel definitions are totally different. So if I were to resize my window and kind of make it a lot bigger and click in the same spot, the percentages have barely changed, but the pixels are significantly different. So in my opinion, Getting X position and Y position configured uh, in terms of the uh, in terms of percentages of screen size is a little more intuitive for using something that could be a whole bunch of different sizes. Now, let's say if not self dot menu, because basically, anytime you put a menu up, you have to understand that any normal clicking functionality needs to be different when the menu is active. So what I'll do is I'll say if the menu is not currently active and that's just something that will go up here and we'll say menu equals false. Okay, so the menu not currently active um, and we'll just say if the menu is not active then we want to sort of check for all our normal touch events. Um, and so the first one will be to just check, check if a color is selected from the color options row, um, and then seven to 93 is the valid colors, seven to 93 in X pause is valid colors. Okay, and actually I wish I hadn't deleted, so I won't, I'll put it back, print x pause comma y pause. Um, 
I'm going to get these numbers by printing out that position. So what I wanna do for checking if something was touched, you could use Kivi's like built-in button widgets, but then you kind of get their pre-built style as well. And since I just wanna turn these regular circles into buttons, what I'll do is I'll check for a, a, a range of Y positions, okay? So let me run this real quick and show you what I'm talking about. When I click to the left of the red, all right, my X position is basically eight, okay? And when I click to the right of purple, my X position is basically 93. Okay, so uh, I think what I used and what I will use here as well was seven, um, which is pretty much here. Yeah, okay, here. So I used seven to eight, 93, divided in six sections. So that's basically 4.5 per color. Um, but what I'm doing is I'm getting the range of spaces. And then for Y, it was basically from what, like uh, like 13 to 26, something like that, or 13ths of the, the screen, okay? But what I'm doing is I'm using this print X pause, Y pause to tell me approximately the range of Y positions and X positions. And so what I can say, is if my Y position is in a range. And the nice way to write this in Python is to say, what's the smallest number that could be used in the selection? And it's basically 100 divided by 13, right? It's that section, so it's that Y row, where I'll just say it here. Y row equals 100 divided by 13, okay? So if it's greater than one row, but it's less than Y row times two, y row times two, um, and the x position is greater than the numbers we just came up with, which I think I'll use greater than or equals to, x pause and less than or equals to. Um, so basically I'm saying, all right, I clicked somewhere between the first and second row between seven and 93% of the window. I definitely clicked on a color that I want to change the selected color. That means that my index is going to be an integer value. So it should be between zero and five, remember? And this will be the X position minus seven. So because we have a 7% offset to the right, um, we just need to account for that when we calculate which color was selected and then divided by 14.5 as an integer will give us whatever index was selected. And then we'll say self dot selected color self.selected color is equal to the index, okay? So this is just one way of handling, I don't know why the indentation gets so goofy. That looks better, I think. Okay, I don't know, the indentation was off, that was weird. Um, all right, so the self.selected color should be equal to the index. That's just one touch event that we need to handle, but let's look and see, all right? So I'm clicking the different colors, and I do believe the index is changing, but we have not updated the background yet, so that's something we do at the very end. Um, but actually, I think we can do that every iteration of this app. Let me make sure, yeah. Um, I think what we wanna do here is just say, regardless when this is done, we update BG. Um, so basically, we're gonna be changing a lot of colors and a lot of lists and a lot of stuff in this on touchdown function. So we need to finish the touchdown function by updating the background. And now you can see, okay, I click purple, I click green, I click red, I click orange. I can change the selected color just by doing that. And clicking anywhere else doesn't do anything yet because we've only handled selecting different colors. But there's our first function, all right? So the next thing to do in on touchdown is check if submit is pressed and increment turn. Um, and for now, I'm just gonna say, come back to this because I still haven't defined the buttons and I'm not sure why. All right, <laughs> okay. Now we're going to check if you clicked on a circle in the active turn to set it to selected color. Okay, so what we just did is we made it to where you could change the selected color. Now we're gonna make it to where you can change the color 
of a circle if it's that active turn. So what we'll do is we'll make this an L if so that we're not doing a bunch of crazy unnecessary extra clicks. Um, but we'll copy the uh, we'll copy the Y row the L if Y row checker and we'll basically say okay if Y row times whatever turn plus two it is and less than Y row times turn plus three. So that's saying whatever the active turn Y range is and the X position is greater than or equal to 20%. So remember, that's just kind of how we divided it. This may make it to where it's technically like a little bit bigger of a click range than the circle, but you clicked on the active row. So we're gonna assume you want to change the color. All right, we'll still come down and we'll still steal that index math, but it's gonna be a little easier now. It's gonna be minus 20 and then divided by 20, okay? So basically fifths of the screen. You're, you're in the right 80%, whatever quarter of that 80% you click on will be the index. We'll then say that the guess colors at our turn, so whatever turn it is, and then at whatever index we just calculated, needs to be equal to self dot selected color and then we need to say that the color is equal to choice colors self dot selected color okay um, and the reason we're doing that is we then say with boy oh boy and this is some kivy specific syntax where things get a little complicated but we say with self dot canvas self dot guesses at turn okay so whatever turn we're at dot insert and then we want to insert at the index that we just calculated a new ellipse where the bg color is equal to color at the color that we're calculating okay so let me get this typed down and make sure my camera's not covering it hopefully um, let me get this typed down and then talk to you more about what we're doing because Kivi can be a little bit weird in this one way. Self dot guesses at turn dot pop and then index plus one plus one. Okay, so there's a couple ways that you can do changing a shape inside of a list. One of them is you can try to update that shape, but what's very complicated is then you need to redraw the entire canvas. Another one that I think is easier is you can add a new version of that shape that's exactly the same size. I said dot poop instead of dot pop. Um, Another way that I think is easier is you redefine that shape, you add a new instance of it, and then you delete the old one. So what I want to do is when you've drawn a new shape of a new color, I just want to add a new one to the guesses list and delete the old one out. Um, to do this, because we're referencing guess colors and color right here, um, we do need to call some globals. So one thing you could do inside this function is you could pass them in. Um, but I want to just call them as globals. It'll be easier. Basically, things that you can change in the on touchdown function um, will be your guess colors, the answer colors, or the turn just by clicking things. So I'm just going to call those three as globals so that we have access to them inside this function and we can change them. Generally speaking, it's not good format to rely on globals a lot inside of functions. It can make debugging harder and uh, passing things in and passing them back is generally thought of as better formatting. But this for me was just an easy solution for this function and it works. Okay, so hopefully I didn't lose you guys too much. What this code is doing is checking if you're clicking on a piece in the active turn and if you are, then it adds a new circle in your color and it deletes the old one out. So let's go ahead and run this and see if it's working. Okay, I have red selected. I can change that to red and that to red, but I can't do anything here because it's not that turn. I can change that to yellow. I can even change the ones that are already red to yellow or pink or blue. So you, you have your whole turn to formulate this and mess around with different combinations and change the colors, but clicking anywhere else does nothing for you, okay? So this is how you take a turn, right? You select what color you want and then you put it wherever you want it to be. 
So I think that looks really good. I think I haven't really been avoiding it for any particular reason, but I think the time is probably here to add the buttons in because we're gonna have a menu button, a submit button, and a restart button. The menu will pop up the rules and tell you how to play the game. Submit will submit your turn for you, and restart will just restart the whole thing, which should make intuitive sense, and uh, let you just play a new version of the game. So I think we just have to add the buttons because on touchdown, which we're not done with, needs those buttons in there so that we can keep uh, formulating that sort of stuff and show how to take a turn, check a guess, get feedback. So let's go ahead and get these buttons added. Okay, so I think coming back to the init BG, yeah, I just uh, I just had a line that said call the buttons to be drawn here. And what I'm gonna do, since this function is already pretty full, I'm gonna make a new function that I'm just gonna call init buttons. Um, and this is a good example of how, actually we don't need to pass self there and we don't need to call it self.init buttons, okay? Just like that. This is a good example of how you can extrapolate things out to their own function so it just gets easier to read, easier to understand. And then we're gonna define the init buttons function down here. And I think people who really know Python and Kivi um, may say that I'm gonna be using <laughs> buttons wrong. Um, because you might as well just make them rectangles the way I'm using them, but self.button append, I'm gonna use the Kivi button widget, just like that, and I'm gonna make three buttons. The first will have text menu, and uh, I'm gonna make the text bold, so bold equals true, just like that. Actually, I think you want this in quotes like that, yep. And we obviously, we have to import this from Kivi. Make sure not to import the Kinter ones, that's a different GUI package. But I'm going to copy this two more times. So we're going to have menu, we're going to have submit, and we're going to have restart. Okay, they'll all be bold, they'll all be buttons just like that, which means we want to come back up into our initializing here and just make a list buttons, and it'll be an empty list initially because we just added the buttons to them, okay? Um, but easy enough, now that is all we have to do in the initialize uh, buttons, but what we want to do is make sure that in the update BG function, we have self.draw buttons, okay? So we have initialize buttons done. Now let's go ahead and come into our update BG down near the bottom where we had add button logic here, very nice. And let's say self.draw underscore buttons, okay? And just as one more reminder, there's one more thing we have to do. We have to add the menu drawing here. So we'll come back for that as well. But now we're going to self.draw the buttons, all right? So again, I'm going to collapse down update BG because it's it's a, a full enough function as is. And let's go ahead and define draw buttons, pass in self. And now let's take a look at displaying those buttons. Similar to all the other shapes, just like a rectangle, excuse me, it really just needs position and size. So self.buttons at zero dot position, so the position will be zero, and then it'll be self.height, self.height minus self.height over 13, um, and It'll be there because you define a rectangle or a button from the bottom of the shape upward. So the position is going to be all the way to the left and then 1 13th um, down from the top of the screen because it's going to be the menu button that we stick in that top left corner. We left a spot specifically for it, okay? So then the size is going to be a fifth of the screen, that's the space we have apportioned to it, that first 20%, and then a 13th of the height. So self.height divided by 13. And I'm gonna copy those, even though we're gonna change all the values, obviously, I'm gonna copy those for one, one, and two, two, just so we have position and size rows. Now for one, one, the position, or uh, for one, the position is really easy. It's, it's gonna be zero, zero, because we want it in the bottom left. And then the width, for submit and restart, they can have half the window. I'm only putting two buttons in that bottom banner. So it's going to be uh, a half of the width and then a 13th of the height. And then for two, um, the position is going to be really easy again, except instead of zero, zero, it's going to be self dot 
width over two. Well, I have width. Width, width, there we go. Self.width over two. Okay, and then uh, for the size, again, just half the window and then a 13th of the height. So this is really easy. This is defining all three buttons really quickly two buttons that each get half the width and they'll be in the bottom of the screen, one in the top left, and we called it for updating and drawing. So hopefully when I run this, you'll see, bang, a menu button, submit and restart. Again, the menu button is kind of goofy, too high. Feel free to scoot that down. Um, I'm sure I messed something up uh, in copying everything down here. But anyways, that's pretty good. The menu button's up there. Submit and restart are down here. Now we have buttons that we can work on for creating the locations in our on touch down uh, function to actually check the guest, draw the menu, restart, uh, submit, all that stuff. So that's it for creating the buttons, for drawing the buttons. Now let's go back into our on touch down function. Whoa. <laughs> It let me dive deeper into Kivi's source code. Uh, in the on touch down function, let's come back to check if submit is pressed in increment turn and actually put that code in now for the submit button. So the submit button is the left half of the screen. So let's go ahead and put here L if um, and then Y pause is less than. Um, so if y pause is less than 100 divided by 13, so uh, a y row, if it's less than one y row, and the x pause is less than 50, right? That means we just clicked on the left half of the screen. Well, if white is not in guess colors, then of whatever turn it actively is, that means we've put a color in all four turns. So a couple things to keep in mind that have to be working for this to work as well. If white is not in the current turns, if that's if in the current turn, if that's the only way we check to make sure we've put valid colors in all four spaces, then you have to make sure to also make the new turn all whites uh, when you go on to the next turn. And that's what we'll do. But basically, if white is not in the guess, uh, then what we do is we'll call a new function called check guess. And that'll be the function that actually gets us the feedback, okay? So we'll extrapolate that out, do a little hand waving and say, we'll do that next. We'll figure out how to check the guess. But we'll add one to the turn. And then um, what I'm going to do just to make sure it's working is I'm going to say if the turn is uh, if it gets to the eighth turn, then I'm going to give myself a little cheat here. I'm gonna just print the answer colors so that if I'm practicing with this, if I'm trying to make it work on my end, uh, I can see the answer and make sure that it works. You don't have to add that line if you don't want to. I just like putting in here a way to make sure that I can win when I build it. <laughs> okay, so then the guess colors of whatever turn we just made it have to go to white, 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 white. And this is easy enough. This is just overwriting the entire guess colors at the current turn, which should be gray, 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 gray when we get to it. And we're just overwriting it with white, 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 white. Now, what we'll do is with self.canvas, similar to when we overwrite the colors, we'll say with self.canvas for i in range four. Let's just go ahead and say self dot self, self dot guesses at turn dot insert. And then at index I, because we're doing this in a for list, an ellipse with BG color equal to, let's scroll it up. I know my camera gets in the way, equal to color. And then it'll be white zero, comma white one, comma white two. Okay, what we're doing is we're inserting white circles and getting rid of the gray circles on the canvas. Because again, like I said, you can try to update them, uh, in which case you need to redraw everything, or you can delete out the old circle and redraw a new circle in the same spot. To the user's eye, those are the exact same things, but for the programmer, I found this to be easier. Um, okay, so we haven't done anything with self.checkGuess yet. Uh, so let me just go ahead and define that function out here and say define 
check guess and I will just pass for now so that we can test this, right? Um, but now when I boot this up, hopefully, uh, so if I hit submit right now, nothing happens because white is there. But if I make them all red and submit, okay, I go on to the next turn and now I can define the colors in this second turn and I hit submit and I can do the third turn, but I can't come back and overwrite the colors in previous turns. I can only work on the turn I'm currently in. Um, okay, so that's pretty cool. The submit button is working. We're not doing anything with the check guess just yet, but that's okay because we're going to do the menu and we'll do the restart button and then we'll actually check for feedback and that'll be the functional part of playing the game and we'll be done. All right, so let's go ahead and uh, just while we're in the uh, on touchdown function, let's go ahead and keep doing uh, restart and then let's do menu and I think think that's it for on touch down and so then we'll just come back and we'll draw the menu all right so let's see click if the active circle yep now let's go ahead and check if restart is pressed if so generate new answers and clear out board okay so what we'll do here is we'll just say if the y position is less than y row just like it was for um for submit but now we'll say and the x position is greater than 50 okay so it's on the right half of the screen um self dot menu equals false we'll just say that because if menu was up and you hit restart you're saying you want to play again so the restart button will be something you can hit while the menu is popped up or while it's not the menu button and the restart button can both be clicked while the menu is up so we'll just clear out self dot menu we'll make a new list of answers equal to and i'm going to just scroll up to where we generate the answers in the first place as these four random choices and those will be the new answers, okay? So new answers equals that same list, four random choices. And now what we'll do is I'll say, okay, well the answer colors are going to be equal to those new answers that I just generated. Turn is going to be equal to zero. Now I'm gonna do a little bit more hand waving and I'm gonna say, uh, let's self dot redraw the screen and then self dot init BG. So this is really a true reset of the screen. Um, so now what I'm not going to do is I'm not going to just say, all right, we'll come back to it. Like we're going to with check guess, we're going to have to do the redraw function now, or this really won't work. So I'll say the last thing we need to do down here is check if menu is pressed and either display or put away the menu based on that click. Okay. But before we do menu, let's go ahead and do this self.redraw function. It's going to be pretty easy because it's mostly stuff that we've already defined. Um, but we do have to basically clear out the canvas, reset some lists, and then we can init the BG again. Okay, so I'm going to minimize on touchdown for just a second. I'm going to come up above like everything else and just call this right here and say define redraw and these are just some steps some clearing out steps that we have to do uh, to be able to reset the board so again i'm going to call guest colors the feedback colors and the solved variable from the outside world so that i can just make sure we have a clean slate and then i'm going to come up here and i'm going to steal guest colors and feedback colors and those are going to be the first two things in here. I'm going to say, all right, I hit the restart button. So these two lists, guest color, guest colors and feedback colors, I'm resetting them to the white first row and then all gray that feedback colors needs to be. And then my solved variable is going to be false. And then all I really need to do beyond that is I need to grab all of these lists and rectangle and active and selected and all these things. And I just need to sort of stuff them in here again okay so the thing is we're not actually redrawing per se so maybe the way i called them out was a misleading name 
um, what we're doing is we're just reinstantiating everything we already made. So we want to just call init and reinitialize it. But to reinitialize everything, uh, we also have to clear everything out. So I might actually have a few more variables here than we need. Um, but make sure to just do self dot whatever, whatever, whatever. And we're basically refreshing. OK, so when we hit restart, we're refreshing all these variables to their initial values. Then we're calling init BG again. And that should be it. Uh, let's go ahead and see now if I hopefully I didn't leave any hanging loose ends. And I'm going to go ahead and hit red, orange, yellow, green, submit. And now if I hit restart, OK, bang, it goes back to um, red as the selected color. We're back to turn zero. I have the cover on, but what you should see, uh, what you could probably see is that every time I click that, the answers are changing. Um, so that's great. Now let's go ahead and take a look at the menu button. Uh, and then we just need to check our guesses to give ourselves feedback and then we'll be ready to play the game. So uh, let's come back into on touchdown. Now that I think we're done with the redraw and let's go and check if menu is pressed and either display or don't display. So what we'll say is, okay, We've done all this if, 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 and this even should be L if. This way, once we come to the row that is where we've clicked, we don't check the other ones, okay? So that'll be pretty nice. Now we'll say L if Y pause is greater than 12 times Y row, okay? Um, so basically, if it's, if it's in the top 13th of the screen, and x pause is less than, and I think we just made it uh, 20. Self dot width over 5. x pause is less than 20. Should be good. Uh, yeah, that's what I'm going with. Okay, what we'll say is if not self dot menu, then I want self dot menu to be equal to true. But then what I'll say is else, that means the menu is already up. Then I'll say actually not else, I'll say L if not solved. So there's three times that you could have the menu up, I think. If you solve the game, I'm gonna have the menu pop up to basically say, hey, here's the rules, hit restart to play again. You could click menu at any time to view the rules and I'm gonna say you can click the menu button again to get it to go away. So if the puzzle is solved, that'll be a kind of a different situation. Um, if the puzzle is solved, then you just click menu or restart to get it to go away again. But if the puzzle is not solved, then clicking it again will just put the menu away. And then for I in range length self dot menu underscore rects, we are going to self dot menu <laughs> dot menu underscore rects uh, I dot size equals zero zero and the reason I'm doing this uh, is I know how the game ends I don't want to foreshadow here but basically I'm going to define a menu that's going to be a couple rectangles so that it has like a multi-tiered border and then I'm going to use an image to show the text rather than define the text inside Kivi I'm going to just pull up an image that explains how to play and all the rules um, and so that's going to be in this menu rects list that we haven't made just yet. But this is me saying, put the menu away, resize them. Otherwise, um, I'm going to define in the draw menu function uh, how to draw the menu. And we haven't shown the draw menu function yet because that's in the update BG. But so this is handling clicking on the menu button. I guess we did menu a little bit backwards. Um, but we're going to handle clicking the menu. So now we need to handle drawing the menu okay and for that it was in update bg and we had a little section down here that was add menu drawing here so let's go ahead to update bg and we'll say if self dot menu right the button that the 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 variable that checks if menu is active we'll do self dot draw menu okay so again extrapolating it out to its own function since update bg is confusing enough and let's go ahead and define draw menu alrighty pass in self and let's think what do we want the menu to be um, self dot menu 
rects. Like I said, I'm gonna have a uh, three tiered border. So what I'm gonna do is I'm gonna put a few rectangles into a list, uh, just like what we did with a lot of our other lists and our lists of ellipses and everything else. And like I said, I'm gonna use a three tiered border effect with some different colors that I made up. This is where you as I guess a game designer or game styler could uh, make it up yourself. Um, but that does mean we need to come into the top and put down here a menu underscore rects equals an empty list, just like that. Okay. Um, and then I'm gonna copy this row. Yeah, copy it three times, gonna have a total of three rectangles in my draw menu function. And uh, I just, again, I liked these colors, so I used some that I really did just make up. I can't say that enough. Um, so don't, don't be like, wait, where are those RGB values coming from? They're coming from the sky. Okay, that was a six, and this was a five, and I liked those three things. Now, with self.canvas colon color, and this is me defining the color of the image I'm about to put in there, 0.8.7, the background kind of mask over it, color. Okay, and then what we'll do is we'll say self.menu underscore rects, and we're going, to, uh, we're going to define all three rectangles sort of manually here, and we're instantiating them and drawing them in the same function. So uh, this is just sort of two birds in one stone in this function that we were doing before. All right, menu rects zero dot size, and it's gonna be equal to self dot size zero, which is the X width divided by two, and then self dot size, which is the height one divided by two. So the biggest rectangle, the back layer, is going to be uh, essentially a quarter of the screen. It'll be half the width and half the size. Uh, and then zero dot pause. And what you'll see is we're gonna get this centered in the middle of the screen. So um, because I'm making it half the width of the screen, if I start at a quarter of the width, it'll take up the middle half of the screen. And same logic for the height. So this is going to be a big rectangle that takes up uh, one quarter of the total screen uh, by volume, I guess, by area, and it'll be in the middle of the screen. And then just self.canvas.add self.menurex0. And we can copy this nice little block of five lines and do it two more times. And I hope I'm not losing anybody on this. To be perfectly honest, I am a self-taught programmer and I found this to be the easiest way to make a menu pop up, appear and disappear um, by doing this. But if you know a more optimal way, don't think that like I'm teaching some holy grail method of doing this uh, because I promise you, I was excited to get this working. I thought it looked cool. And so I made the tutorial on it. And if you have a way that works better, good for you. So then these, I just used spacers. I said, okay, it's gonna be 10 pixels smaller in total, <clears throat> and it'll be scooted uh, plus five in from both dimensions. And so this is how I said, I'm gonna have a border of five around that one, and then a border of 10 around this one, or I think it's another five actually, and then plus 10, and then plus 10. And then what I actually ended up doing for this one is I made the smallest rectangle that was on the inside. I made it my image. So I made this in a different application and it's got try to guess the secret code. Red is the right color in the right spot. White is the right color in the wrong spot. Press restart to play another. Press menu again to resume. It was easy to make that menu image on its own. So what I do is I just take this little rectangle here that's inside two other rectangles and I say self dot menu rects to dot source. Okay, so this is saying pull your background, pull the, the backdrop from an image. And I called the image mastermind.png. And then just like the other one, go ahead and say uh, self dot canvas dot add and then add it. Okay, so that should be all we need to do to draw the menu when it's time. 
there we added a lot kind of quickly there let's go ahead and see if clicking the menu works menu okay look it says mastermind menu try to guess the secret code it tells you the rules it says restart to play another press menu again to resume if i click menu again okay the menu's supposed to go away in that case <laughs> all right so let's take a look of why it's not going away when i click the menu button again other than that it looks pretty cool actually one more test let's see if i press uh okay red orange yellow green submit let's see if i press menu and then restart okay the menu's supposed to go away then too so let's take a look at why the menu's not going away when we hit restart or the menu button again i think the issue is probably that actually we put this if not self dot menu in at the very beginning and kind of forgot about it but the restart button and the menu button still need to get checked even if it is menu so let me come back here and say actually okay so now we're saying it, even if menu is pressed, we need to check if restart or menu get clicked again. So it's just a matter of backing these out, changing this to an, an if instead of lf, and making sure they're not indented under something that says if not menu. Because now if menu pops up and I want to just resume this game, okay, red, orange, green, yellow, submit, move on. If I hit menu, I want a reminder of the rules, and then I want to put menu away and keep playing this one, that should still work for me. If I click menu and I want to restart it all and reset it, that should still work for me. But if I click menu, I don't want to be able to change these colors in the background while I'm playing, and I can't. So that's good. That's why menu and restart weren't working. That looks awesome. So now all three buttons do what we want them to do. Uh, we can select and submit turns the right way. The only real thing we're not doing yet is we're not checking our guess to, to give ourselves feedback after that guess. Um, and that's why we haven't been able to sort of get hints about the game and really play the game the way Mastermind is meant to be played. So we have to do this check guess function. It's uh, actually, it's pretty intense because there's quite a, a few different like algorithmic things you have to think about in checking this guess. But just so you guys know where we're at overall, the final project, the final build is about 330 lines of code. We've got 295 of them in here. So another 30 lines, and we'll be done with this entire mastermind program. So let's dive right into check guess, okay? Okay, so the check guess function is going to be responsible for telling us whether or not the puzzle's been solved. So we'll just call global solved. Again, I've explained that I am aware that that is not uh, the optimal way of doing it. Um, but that's what we're going to do here. Okay. So global solved, uh, and then we are going to grab the last turn and it's going to be equal to the guess colors at whatever the turn currently is. So, um, one thing that probably we should do is we should go back into on touchdown where the submit button is, uh, which was this guy. Yeah. Um, and I think I waved my hand at you guys and said, hey, we're going to check the guess. So here's self.check guess. If you forget, we have not yet changed the turn. So check guess is going to run with whatever the actively uh, selected turn is. Uh, so we change the turn counter after we check the guess. So uh, that just should help you understand where in the program we are when we run this. Okay. So we're going to get the uh, whatever the last turn was, so whatever those four colors that we're actively guessing are. And then the response is, um, it's going to be a list of four values that I'll start by populating with gray. So it'll be gray by default, and then we'll add and overwrite um, new values as we check were there pieces that were in the right spot and the right color, were there pieces that were the right color but in the wrong spot. As we go through, we'll overwrite these values from gray to whatever they are. And then we're going to go ahead and create a counter that's a response index. And we're going to use that to check some kind of more complicated things like, oh, if I guessed three reds and the answer had two reds and one of them's right but in the right spot, one of them's wrong but it, uh, or the right color but the wrong spot, and we don't count third one at all, we'll need that response index, okay? So what we're going to do is we're going to say for i in range and you could absolutely just say four here uh strictly speaking i'm gonna say range last turn if for some reason you decide to make your version of mastermind have five colors or whatever this would still work for you um 
But okay, the easiest thing to check for is did I get the color exactly right? So what I'll do is I'll say if choice colors at last turn at I, okay? So choice colors is going to tell me uh, what the actual color was based on that index. So I don't wanna get too confusing here, but we need everything in terms of like an RGB value that we can compare one to another. And we saved different things in these different indexes. Like last turn, we just saved the index of the color. So zero, one, two, three, four, or five, which coordinates to red, orange, yellow, green, blue, purple using the choice colors list. So this is us saying if the color of that guess is equal to the answer colors list at I, then we have a red, okay? We have a responses, <clears throat> uh, responses at whatever our response index is, so this is the first piece, then we set it equal to red, and we increment our response index by one. That means we've done all the checking we have to do for zero. So this is saying if if I get to the first guess and I guessed it was blue and it was blue, we're gonna make a little peg equal to red. Um, some versions of the game use black and white feedback pegs. I use red and white feedback pegs, it doesn't matter. Um, but we're going to move on because that was the easy one. And actually what I'll do is I'll give myself a little hint too in the terminal. I'll say uh, F and I'm gonna do an F string and just say, hey, the uh, piece that you just guessed here, um, that was in the right spot, is in the right spot. So I'm gonna tell myself as I play the game a little bit um, and you should definitely go back and delete those once you're ready to like give it to someone else to play. But as a programming exercise, it's really useful for debugging to tell yourself what's going on in your program. Okay, the next thing we need to check for is if it's in the uh, answer colors list, but it wasn't the correct spot. So this is saying an L if, um, and if it's in answer colors, things start to get a little more complicated because just because it wasn't in the correct spot, but it is in the answer colors list, that doesn't immediately mean that it's a white peg, that it means right color, wrong spot. Because for example, you could guess three reds and the answer only has one red. So you might have guessed red, 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 and then a blue. The answer might be blue, 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 and then a red. You don't want three white pegs. You only want one white peg to tell you that there's one red in there. So it gets a little complicated. To piece this out, what we're gonna start with is say, okay, the guess count is going to be from our last turn dot count and then last turn dot I. So this is telling us how many times we guessed the specific color that we're checking for right now. And the answer count is going to tell us how many times that uh, answer pops up. So answer colors dot count choice colors at last turn at I. Okay, so because we have so many lists, I know this can start to get a little confusing conceptually, but we're getting two things here. We're getting how many times that guess appears in our guess and how many times that guess appears in the answer. And what we'll do is we'll say if this is the only one of this color in our guess, it's a white peg, okay? So that would be only input, all right? So here's where we can say, well, we only guessed one red. Only input is gonna be a true false uh, Boolean that will say will be equal to the outcome of guess count equal to one, okay? So basically, if we only guessed that color one time, we're gonna use this variable only input to tell us, yes, I only guessed one red, so it's definitely a white peg. And then what we'll say is if there are several inputs, actually if there's more, if there are more answers of that color than guesses, it's a white peg as well. So this would be saying like, 
okay, I guessed two reds, but the answer actually has three reds, then anytime I see a, a, a red, even if it's not in the correct spot, count it as a white because there's, there's more um, outputs. So what I'll do is I'll make another Boolean bit that I'll call several outputs. And this is going to be equal to if my answer count is greater than or equal to my guess count, okay? Now there's one more scenario and this one gets tricky. If there are more inputs than outputs, we only want to count it if it's not being used as a red peg and we didn't count it as a white already. So if there are more guessed than in answer, only count if not a red and not a white already. So you could think of this as a scenario where you guessed three reds, you got one of them correct as a red peg, and the other two reds were in the wrong spot. You have to do the math to make sure that this one is the only one getting counted for that. So we have to do, we're already inside a four I loop, so we have to do a nested loop here and say for J in range, length of last turn, or again, you could say four if you know you're only playing the four guess version, um, but we're gonna create a couple new things. We're going to say the indexes for this color, and that'll be an empty list, and then we'll say the answer, answer indexes for this color. So we're gonna get all of the indexes of our list that are the color we're currently looking at. And now what we'll say is, okay, if last turn at j so we're going to quickly cycle through all of last turn inside the for loop that's already cycling through last turn is equal to and if this part is hard and you're just kind of copying down the code that i'm saying and you don't fully understand it just know this is the hardest piece of programming in this game is figuring out how to check a turn and appropriately return the answers so if everything up to this point made sense to you and this is a little bit harder don't feel bad about that. This was the hardest part to program. And if you do understand what we're doing, you're awesome. <laughs> Good job, because I know that sometimes I don't make things uh, the easiest to understand. So what we're going to do is we're going to say, all right, if last turn at J is equal to last turn at I. So last turn at I is the color that we're checking against. So this could be red or orange or yellow. And now I'm doing a J uh, nested for loop to check all of the indexes where that color appears. And so we're going to say, and choice colors at last turn J is not equal to answer colors at J. Okay. And so in my mind, this is just the most elegant way I could think of for checking and making sure that we are checking to see, oh, not for, that's an if. Okay. What we're doing is we're checking to see hey, is this a potential candidate for a white peg? So this part is checking to see if it'll get used as a red peg, okay? And if it does, we definitely don't count it. But if uh, it's in there, then what we'll do is we'll add to these indexes dot append J, okay? So we're telling ourselves all of the places where white candidates of that color might appear. Then what we're gonna do is we're gonna do a similar if statement but for the answer indexes. So what we'll do instead of last turn J, we'll do if answer colors at J is equal to choice colors, choice colors at last turn. And this will be I, because remember last turn I is the color that we're searching for. And so then we'll still use and choice colors at last turn J is not equal to answer colors J. So this is going to tell us all of the candidates for white pegs that are in the answers, okay? And if that's really complicated, um, sorry, but this was the simplest way I could think of doing it. So what I'll do too, so that we can use it um, during troubleshooting, and you can delete these uh, if you want these print statements, you don't want them all over your program, that's fine. But I'm going to print these indexes and answer indexes when we have this scenario, because for troubleshooting, this was a sticky bit of code to get through. So what I'll do is I'll say, okay, should I count the peg that I'm currently looking at as a white or not in the event of having more guest colors than there are answer colors? 
and I'll say count this <clears throat> will be a third Boolean that will check if these indexes dot index of I. Okay, so this is telling me where in my list of these indexes the currently checked piece is. And if it's less than the length of answer indexes, that's all I have to check is how many total candidates are in my answer. And if my index in the these indexes list is before that, I can count this. Otherwise, don't count it. So now, I have three different scenarios where I'd want to count it as a white peg. I'd want to say if I have the only input or I have more outputs than inputs or I want to count this peg. Then in any of those situations, I want responses at response index to be equal to a white peg and then I want my response index plus equals one. And then similar to, similarly to how I printed, uh, oh, this is in the right spot. I'm gonna take that F string and I'll say print. And then this will be last turn at I is in the, is in the answer, but wrong spot. Okay, so this is, again, not part of the game. This is something I tell myself so I can see if my program is working properly. Um, and that's everything we need to check for white and red pegs, but let me go ahead and uh, collapse down this for loop because the next thing we're gonna do is no longer inside of that for loop. The next thing we're gonna do is uh, I'm actually going to shuffle the responses. Most versions of the game allow random feedback. So this actually makes the game harder. This is saying there's no rhyme or reason to where your white and red pegs appear. So the top left corner will not always be feedback about the first spot. Basically, you're just getting aggregate data. So if you get two red pegs and one white peg, there's no rhyme or reason to uh, there's no rhyme or reason to what order they'll appear in over on the left. They're just telling you somewhere in your puzzle you have two right and one uh, wrong. So. Um, basically, we're just going to do random dot shuffle. It's an it's a built-in function of random, and randomly shuffle the four response data, and then what we'll do is we'll draw the feedback over top of the um, response circles. So we'll say for i in range um, four length of responses. Either way, it would be fine. Color is going to be equal to responses at i. And then with self.canvas, hopefully this is starting to get a little more familiar. Uh, I know it's still a lot of Kivy syntax. But we'll grab the color. We'll say with self.canvas, <clears throat> self.feedback at whatever the turn currently is, dot insert, and then at index i, we're going to insert an ellipse where the bg underscore color is equal to capital C color, and then it needs three arguments, color zero, color one, and color two, okay? And then self.feedback at the current turn dot pop, and I did pop instead of poop this time, um, but, I, but I still, I got ahead of myself. All right, there we go, pop. And then uh, the index we're gonna pop here is just i plus one. So we go through, we add a new one at index, that's gonna push the one that was previous layer previously there up one value so we get rid of that then what we do is we just check if it's solved and this is really easy if responses dot count of red so how many reds appear in the responses well if the count of that is four then solved equals true we'll go ahead and print down in the uh, down the terminal window we'll print solved uh, and then self.menu equals true. So that's what I'm gonna do, is pop the menu up when you solve the game. And then self.update bg, okay? Just so that everything uh, visually appears. Now, gosh, that is a lot of code there in check guess. This, uh, this checking through for all the whites is really a complicated bit of code, but I think we nailed it. Let's go ahead and play this game real quick. And I'll make the terminal window real big so you can see all the cheats we put in to help us beat this a little faster. 
Let's go ahead and check red, orange, yellow, green. Okay, so it says we've got two yellows and my little cheat sheet here says that zero and one are in there but in the wrong spots. So let's put uh, zero there, that's red, and let's put orange there and then let's try two blues. Okay, so now it's telling me, oh, all right, one is there but in the wrong spot. Uh, so is zero and so is one blue, but they're all in the wrong spots. So let's try zero, let's try red, let's try blue and let's put a pink in there. All right, now we have, this is incredible. We have all four colors, but they're all in the wrong spots. And if you were to block, if you were to hide my little cheat sheet over here, you could see the way this is working is it told me in the first guess that two of those colors were correct, but in the wrong spot. Um, and so if I had picked red and orange and said, all right, I'm gonna try those in new spots and then try two new colors. And I put two blues in there and it said, oh, you're getting closer. Then I use those three and I try them again. So what I can say with pretty high confidence since I haven't gotten any red pegs yet is red must go there. Orange must go there. That leaves pink has to go there and blue has to go there. So if I hit submit now, bang, I get four reds, which means I got it all correct. It reveals the answer in the top, the menu pops up and it says restart to play another menu again to resume. But because the game is solved, clicking menu won't do anything. I have to hit restart. All right, now let's try four reds. Oh, none of them are in there. Okay, let's try four oranges. One's in there. Um, and actually our little cheat sheet off to the left tells me that it's gonna be index two that's correct. Uh, so that's fun. I'm definitely cheating, but I built the game so I can cheat. Those are the rules. All right, so that tells me I got the orange correct and then the two, three, the green is in the wrong spot. Let's put a couple blues in there. Um, all right, so uh, this blue is incorrect. The rest of them are sweet. So let's try that. And does that do it? It does. Okay, so obviously I'm able to beat the game really quickly because I'm cheating with my stuff on the right or on the left in the terminal window. Um, as programmer, you get to play God a little bit. But uh, again, this app has so much going on. It's one of the first big projects I built in Kivi. I'm definitely not thrilled with the uh, button and the answer cover being off by a little bit. I might tweak it before I upload it to GitHub to just make sure it looks good. But I grew up playing this game. It's a super fun uh, game in my mind. And sometimes you take for granted how simple games that you play in person can get really complicated when you start trying to program them in. I found the same thing when I made chess is it's a relatively simple game that you start trying to build a program and get all the, the different rules and things for, and it just blows my mind how complicated these things can get. So I hope you had fun programming along. If you stuck it through the entire video, just know I really, really appreciate you. Um, it's definitely a difficult sort of, uh, it's a difficult sort of thing to do to keep up with life and having all these life changes and also build big projects and record these long videos for you. But I have a great time doing it. I love where the channel's at. I think the direction we're heading is fantastic. So thank you so much for watching. Be sure to drop any questions or comments you have below in the comments. Let me know down there what you'd like to see more of on the channel. Don't forget to leave a like on the video, subscribe to the channel. If you'd like to consider becoming a super supporter of the channel, my Patreon link will be down there as well. I appreciate the heck out of my Patreon supporters and everyone else who is here watching a video on LeMaster Tech. Until next time, good luck with all your projects. Good luck with life. I'll see you next time. Thanks. Bye.